I'm back. Excuse me, I woke up this morning with a sore throat and there is a congestion happening right here. If I lose the voice, I'm going to do signs, okay? (laughs) Stop cheering. That's me. (laughs) But our first reading comes from John chapter 2, verses verses 1 through 11. It reads, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, standing there, there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it, take it to the chief steward. So they d- took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, now that we come into your message, into your word, we ask that you speak to our lives, to our hearts, to our minds, to our understanding. Let us hear you first. Before I say a word, in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Why is the Ram gone? Does that sound familiar? I'm going to say it again. Why is the Ram gone? Familiar? No? It's from a movie, a very popular Disney movie. What, what was that? Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, this, this scene of Jack Sparrow played by Johnny Depp, uh, it happened on a maroon, he gets maroon on this island. And as Captain Jack Sparrow is happy, very happy, that there is an abundance of rum in the island, his partner, Elizabeth Swan, played by Kira Knightley, is not so happy. As they had a night of drinking and singing and dancing, and as Jack Sparrow, Captain Jack Sparrow, is waking up, he smells the burning rum. Elizabeth Swan is burning all the rum. And that's when Jack Sparrow says, Why is the rum gone? In today's scripture, we deal with almost the same question. Where did the wine go? For a few moments, let's Concentrate our attention on verses 1 and 2. These verses give us the setting of our story. It reads, And on the third day there was a wedding, the occasion of our story, in Cana of Galilee. There were several towns in Galilee called Canaan, but specifically Kephar, Cana, is usually the accepted location for this event, which, by the way, has a little... little 
cathedral, little church that right in front they sell the sweetest wine ever. Or so they have told me. Yeah. And the mother of Jesus was there. Notice how John first mentions Mary as being the invited guest. And Jesus was also invited as a second-hand guest. You know, when you get invited to a wedding, you have to take your kids with you. And his disciples as well, the kids' friends. She obviously was a friend of the family. At least she was close enough to the family to get involved in the administration of the wedding. You wouldn't go up to your guests and say, we have no more wine. Now, it's important to remember that the event of the wedding at Cana is recorded only in the Gospel of John. More importantly, it is the first public miracle that the Gospel records. Jesus has just been baptized and called disciples, and now he's attending a very common event with them and his mother, a wedding. A wedding in those days was a several-day celebration that will involve the whole community. And, and wine was a big part of the celebration. For when it will run out, it was certainly a signal that the end of the celebration was at hand. Question. Do you feel as if the wine is running out in your life? This was disturbing news that Jesus' own mother brings to him. There was no more wine, or according to Eduardo's gospel, where did the wine go? Now you might ask yourself, why does Mary care? And perhaps even more curiously, what does she think Jesus can do about it? And so we witness a kind of an odd exchange between Jesus and his mother. After Mary tells him there is no more wine, Jesus, in a rather cryptic and short manner, replies to his beloved mother, What does that have to do with you? And more importantly, with me. My hour has not yet come. Yet, despite these words, Jesus goes ahead and remedies the situation by having large jars filled with water, jars that will normally be used only for purification before worship. He then turns water into wine, but not just any wine. Rather, it is the best wine of the entire celebration. Even the manager says, Whoa, you say the best for last. So of all the miracles that Jesus could have performed, such as healing the blind or the lame or even raising someone from the dead, Jesus' first miracle is as he begins his public ministry is to turn water into wine. It's kind of funny when you think about it. And you have no idea how many people use this piece of the story. But pastor, even Jesus provided wine to the party. Why can't I? If this is the only thing we take away from the story, we might be missing the point of it. Of all the possible stories that, of Jesus that John could have picked, he highlights this one. But this is not a mere sleight of hand or a magic trick. There is something more going on here, not only within the story, but within us. As we read the Gospels, we need to keep a sharp eye, a sharp mind to see similarity, maybe parallel stories. Psalmist David makes reference to a cup, a cup that runneth over by God's provision. It is in the wedding of Ca at Cana that Jesus fills jars, not cups, with the best of, wa of wine, God's provision at its best. Now, up to this point, we have only talked about the miracle of water becoming wine. But if this is our only center of attention, then we miss what is perhaps the most important point of our gospel. In the beginning, the jars are empty. The jars are not simply full of water waiting for Jesus to turn water into wine. There is nothing 
in the jars. They are dry. They are parched. Ever felt thirst? And then you take that sip of water, that refreshing sip that makes things that make things all better. If we are honest with ourselves, we will recognize ourselves in the story. We are those empty jars in Cana. And there are times in our life when we recognize this truth, perhaps after the breakup of a relationship or the loss of a loved one, being laid off from a job, caught in a cycle of an addiction that never quite satisfies, never quite fills our hearts to the brim. We spend a lifetime trying to fill these jars with stuff, with careers, with possessions, relationships. But in the end, there's only one person who can fill our emptiness. And you know what I'm about to say. And I'm sure most of you believe it, that God, the one that created us, and the one who loved us enough to die for us. It is the living God, our Lord Jesus Christ, a God who not only fills us, with life that miraculously creates us anew, a God that is about transformation, not about damnation. Sometimes we think that God is some kind of a superhero. Maybe Aquaman, that only has powers in certain spaces like water. Or sometimes we confuse God as a historic event. Let me say that God was, God is, and God will be. God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If you abide in Him, He will abide in you. God is not limited by water, by shade of skin, by people, by belief. God is an all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present God. If we just recognize that our jars, our cups are dry, or even in need of new wine. Can you imagine what God could do? Maybe your jars are not empty. Like I said earlier, maybe they're, maybe we have filled them with stuff. Maybe it's time to empty ourselves. And if we read the story over and pay attention, we see that the servants... Go and fill those jars with water. Not just halfway, not three quarters of the way, not 99.999% of the way. The servants fill them up to the brim. It is Jesus who makes the transformation. We provide the water. We become co-creators with God in transforming this dry, purge, and longing world. When was the last time that you felt filled to the brim by God? When were your expectations so high that there was no space for anything else but God? It speaks to me that the servants were excited about what Jesus was going to do. They probably didn't expect Jesus to turn water into wine. Maybe they thought he was going to clean everyone's feet. Remember, the jars were used for purification. I don't know about you, but I seek that willingness and excitement when I seek God. To wake up on a Sunday morning and bring my jar full of water. And wait and see what God is going to do. To wake up and have my expectations all the way to the brim and say, fill my cup, runneth over. Let my life be filled with the best of wine. I don't know about you. God knows. But maybe your jar is dry, it's perched. Maybe the wine has gone a little bit stale. as we go into our hymn. The altar is open. The invitation is the following. That we may close our eyes. That we may be able to visualize our lives. To see 
jars that might be empty, halfway, three quarters, that we may be able to come and say, I have my expectations full to the brim. Would you make the transformation in my life? The altar is open. Let's stand as we sing.